Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I, I am Nacho Coloma. I work with Google Cloud Platform. I am solution engineer, meaning that I help companies that are deploying their systems to take them to the cloud, and I uh, support them with about best practices and how to do things. Um, today we're going to cover a, lo a lot of ground, and some of the some of the subjects are going to be more technical, some are going to be less technical. In, and in general, it's about when you are migrating something to the public cloud, and uh, when you are designing your system for the hybrid cloud, for example, what is the difference with deploying on-premises, and what are the things that you should keep an eye uh, on top of? For those that are not familiar with us, um, on Google, uh, at the Google Cloud Platform team, what we do, uh, we, design, uh, we, design the si we take the systems that we manage at Google internally, uh, like Google Search, Gmail, YouTube, the small parts that make that, make that scale, the small parts that make everything possible, and we take them to the, to the public and we make them possible to be, uh, to be used by others. Today we're going to be talking about the hybrid cloud, also, uh, also about uh, Kubernetes and containers, a uh, really small, a really small uh, wrap up about, uh, about the subject, then third generation cloud, and uh, yeah, and we're, we are giving away com uh, Chromecast. So, um, so you are designing for the hybrid cloud, and that means that you are designing a single application that you want to deploy in multiple platforms. You want to deploy on premises, and you want to deploy in the public cloud. And there are many valid reasons to do that, uh, to do things that way. Maybe it's because you want to use your premises because you have this investment already done. Or maybe you just want to send your overload capacity to the cloud, to, uh, to the public cloud. Or maybe you, we are just in process of migrating something from on-premises to the public cloud. There are many valid reasons to put things in the in the public in the in a hybrid scenario, but by far the most common one is about thinking about bursting of users. Bursting uh, is about uh, irregular irregular demand of your systems, where suddenly you are going to experience a lot of users that you are not prepared to to address. And if you are designing something like on-premises, then you just need the hardware to be able to address this many users. It doesn't matter if this doesn't ever come or not. If you are going to make it to the news, then you're going to, f uh, to, f uh, to see an unpredictable burst, something that you couldn't expect. But the most common one by far is the one that you can see on the right, things that happen periodically. And it could be, for example, that your application uh, every weekend is experiencing a bell valley of, of requests. There are not so many users during the weekend, or it could be during vacations, either summer or winter. You're going to have less users do, uh, during that period. If your application is in a single time zone, this, uh, this is going to happen every day. Every day during the night, you're going to experience a valley of, of requests. And if you are going to do that in the public cloud, then you can auto scale according to demand, so you don't have to pay for, uh, for servers that you're not actually using. Yeah, and this is a huge difference with deploying on-prem. You're deploying on-prem, you, you have to address the worst possible scenario, the worst possible case, even if these machines are not actually doing anything during the most of the year. But when you're deploying to the cloud, you can adapt. It doesn't matter if you're using virtual machines or containers, you can, you can automatically scale for demand. But when you're designing for that, when you're designing for automatically scaling, it matters how you design things. It matters that, that your application starts as fast as possible. And as fast as possible in, the, in, in Google Cloud Platform means 40 seconds to launch a VM, uh, 40 seconds to launch a, vir a virtual machine. And that's, uh, that's homogeneous. It doesn't matter if you're starting too many machines at the same time. You can start thousands of VMs at the same time and still experience 40 seconds to, to start each one of them as an, as an average. And then, if you are starting, if you are working with containers and you are working with Kubernetes, it gets even better because you can get a pod uh, started in five seconds, in the 99th uh, percentile. But that's starting your VMs. And you're going to be doing this either daily or weekly. What happens when you are stopping virtual machines? Because it's also going to happen every day or every weekend. And if you are stopping, there are things where we can help uh, in terms of, for example, billing per minute, not per hour. That's one of the first things. If you are stopping your machines every day, all of these add up. And as, as well, no upfront payment means that you don't have to pay in advance for, your ma for machines that you're not actually using. Let's say, for example, that you want to guarantee the best possible pricing with another uh, cloud provider. Maybe you have, to, you have to commit for 
three machines, 10 machines, 100 machines in advance for one year, two years or three years. And it's hard to calculate how many machines you actually want because it's hard to know what, you, what you're going to have six months from now. If you're asking for commitment for one year, it's, it's hard. And apart from that, organizing these many machines that you have committed, you have committed for 30 machines, and suddenly you find out that you are trying to ma mix and match everything to put everything instead of these 30 machines. With Google Cloud Platform, we do things the other way around. Every month, a machine that is up and running, every month, the first week, you're paying for 100% of the price, then you have 20% discount for the next week, 40% and then 60% discount for the last week of the month. If for any reason you're stopping your machine, then all these periods are going to be concatenated to give you the best possible pricing. And this is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about every day you're going to be starting and stopping machines. And Google Cloud Platform is going to concatenate all these periods and say, OK, you had one ma machine for three weeks. We're applying full price, 20% discount, 40% discount every month. Uh, and then one of the best features in, in Google Cloud Platform when it comes to, to this cost is VM right sizing. And VM right sizing is basically a warning that is going to appear in your console when we find out this virtual machine is bigger than it should be. You have a, a virtual machine here that you could have, you could be paying less uh, because you are actually not using CPU or memory. This, which can be also dismissed if you are not interested in this kind of warnings. This can be applied with just clicking on apply. You don't even have, have to think about it. You just have to click the, the big blue button, and it's going to apply the modifications already in your VMs. It's, it's, it's optimistic to think that you are always going to have full attention to your infrastructure. That's typically not the case. And it happens every now and then that you forget about one machine that is up and running. And this is the kind of things that are going to, uh, to work as reminders saying, you know what, this machine, you're not actually using it. Or this machine could be smaller, uh, could be smaller than, than what it is right now. When, when it comes to auto scaling, and it comes about scaling up and scaling down systems, some, uh, some features in Google Cloud Platform will help, but some are still responsibility of the user. For example, when a user, uh, some uh, responsibility of the developer, when a user is uploading a huge file and it's taking 10 minutes to upload the file, and this is a one possible scenario, one particular example. In this case, we're thinking about, we're talking about using containers. We're talking about either Container Engine or OpenShift, depending if it's managed by Google, or uh, OpenShift installed by, by you or installed by, uh, by Red Hat in the case of OpenShift dedicated. And then you're saving your files, either in a persistent disk mounted in your virtual machine, NFS or GlusterFS servers, or on Google, uh, Google Cloud Storage, which is equivalent to Amazon S3, if you, if you want uh, a point of comparison. Then your files, are, uh, sorry, your files are traveling all the way through your servers and to these storage systems. What happens if the user has been uploading a file for 10 minutes, and now you need to downscale your cluster? You need to kill this instance. You have two options. One is to stop the transfer, so your user has been uploading a file for 10 minutes and then you are, uh, you are stopping it there. Or you have to wait for the user to finish, and do you know how much longer it's going to take? It could take minutes. And none of these are good options, right? So there is a third option that is not take this traffic through your servers. You can upload contents, the user can upload contents directly to Google Cloud Storage without going through your servers. This feature is called signed URLs. Your server is going to prepare a URL and say, OK, I want this URL. It's going to be valid for 10 minutes. You can configure the, the amount of time. It's going to be valid for 10 minutes. Someone is going to be uploading a file of type document or type image or type video uh, from 100K to 10 gigabytes size and then send that URL directly straight to the user. So the user is going to be speaking directly to our servers here. It's not going to be going through your servers. That means, first of all, it's cheaper because you, don't, you are not paying for the virtual machine instance time. But then if you want to scale up and down, this is not affecting your uploads. Anything that is happening here should be short-lived uh, short requests, meaning that in seconds you can scale down. And that makes your whole architecture much more agile. So moving, everything, moving all heavy loads, moving all the huge files to Google Cloud Storage has this effect on the public cloud. But if you're thinking about private on-prem deployments, for on-premise on deployments, you can still be sending your files to Google Cloud Storage and save the need 
for backup copies and so on. The thing is that when it comes to store, we can think that all storage is the same, but actually it's not. These are some, uh, some comparisons between Google Cloud Platform, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and Amazon S3. And when you're thinking about storing your files with S3 infrequently access, standard, or cross-regional, uh, cross these are the equivalent Google Cloud Storage uh, products. Particularly, if you're thinking about cold storage, files that you are not using that much, you're not using that frequently. With AWS, you would have to go with Glaphere, which is a different API. With Google Cloud Platform, it's exactly the same interface that, uh, that we're using for everything else, and it's compatible with S3. You don't even have to change your code if you don't want to. And then the difference here in performance is huge. With Glacier, when you are downloading a file, it's going to take two to five hours to start the download, while with Google Cloud Storage Call Line, a new flavor of Google Cloud Storage, um, Cloud Storage Call Line is going to start in milliseconds. Then you have Nearline for infrequently accessed files, uh, regional and multi-regional. I mean, regional thinking that you want your data to remain in the European Union. And when you go with multi-regional, I mean, the y-axis had to be broken here because it starts at twice the price uh, for, for S3. So not all storage types are the same. Um, so depending on, on the kind of file that you want to store, either it's uh, a backup files or disaster re recovery scenario, files that are uh, rarely accessed, for example, your, uh, your long tail of files, 10% of my files are accessed daily, and 90% of my files are almost never addressed. And you can save that as near line, or regional or multi-regional, depending on how you want to do the deployments. These are some of the features that you can have from the public cloud out of the box, and you don't have to do anything. And this comes together with the extra capacities of our network. Our network is uh, basically leveraging the network that we have on Google Cloud Platform. 70 points of presence around the world, 70 points of presence that we use to deliver, uh, to the, deliver Google Search and Gmail as close to the user as possible. <coughs> to do this, basically, we have as much presence around the world as possible, and we try to send the traffic through the point of presence that is closer to your user. So if you're deploying your application, for example, in Europe here, and your user is connecting from the US, we have more than 50 uh, load balancers around the world to bring the load balancer as close to the user as possible. That means that if your user is connecting with any cloud provider, uh, what you're going to have is a connection that goes through the public internet until it arrives to the load balancer and then from here to your virtual machine. This is the cheapest way of doing things. The traffic goes outside of my infrastructure as soon as possible, and then it's the public internet. You want something better, you need a CDN. With Google Cloud Platform, what you have by default is this scenario over here. The last mile is there. If your user is connecting from the US, the point of presence that is closer to them is in the US. If they are connecting from Asia, then they will have to go to the closest point of presence. But from here on, it's going through our internal network, our high-capacity network using our own fiber, not shared with any other provider. It's the same feature that we use for our, our own products. And you're deploying in the same infrastructure that we're using, so you're using the same network. Now, you can think about using a CDN, nonetheless, and that's totally an option. You want to use a CDN, uh, be free to do that. But even the smallest project deployed on Google Cloud Platform is already using this, because this is how our network wo uh, works. So low uh, low lower latency, which is always good. When it comes to regions, we are still increasing. These are, uh, these are as, as, as I mentioned, these are our fiber network connecting all the different points of presence and regions around the world. What you can see here in color green are the actual regions existing today. And on blue are the regions committed for 2017. In particular here, Frankfurt, Finland, and London. Each one with multiple zones, multiple availability zones. So if you want high reliability without leaving Frankfurt, you can have that. Each one of these zones, I mean, when we're talking about three different zones in Frankfurt, each one of these zones is going to have an independent provider for power and communications. And then when it comes for time to, because we're thinking about hybrid cloud, when it comes to connecting to, to your data center, you have multiple options. With all of them, you can connect via VPN. You, you want just to use the public internet to connect your data center with Google Cloud Platform, you can just do that. 
and you can do that in a in a secure and encrypted way using Cloud VPN. But you can also use direct peering, and direct peering in this case is about connecting your network with Google Cloud directly with a direct cable, and you have also the, the possibility of saying, I want a service provider in between that is guaranteeing bandwidth, that is guaranteeing that no matter what, uh, you're guaranteeing me that this is the amount of bandwidth that I'm going to get. This is a cheaper option, cheaper than uh, using your own cable, cheaper option, and you have plenty of providers for the service, of which these are just an example, including from Equinix to Level 3 to Verizon and so on. So, so we have talked about storage and auto scaling, and we have talked about networking. What happens when you want to deploy Docker containers? And in this case, using Kubernetes, for uh, for example. And I'm sure that all, all of us are aware already that you can deploy Docker containers using OpenShift. OpenShift with any of the three uh, possible distributions, online, enterprise, or dedicated. Either you install OpenShift and you assume all the support, you install OpenShift and Red Hat is providing the support, or with dedicated, Red Hat is, is doing the installation and is providing with the support for your, for your options. And this is a platform, uh, platform as a service offering, meaning that you're going to have a native web interface uh, to help you, uh, to help you um, manage your platform. With Container Engine, what you have is a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster working already out of the box. It's just a point and click interface where you can say, OK, this is my Google Cloud Platform project. I want a cluster up and running. And this is the number of nodes that I want it to have. Once it's up, you can start deploying stuff. It's more in the infrastructure as a service uh, side of things, either the command line or the, native, uh, or the native Kubernetes console you can use to deploy your applications. And it's managed by Google. And managed by Google means that, for example, your cluster are going to be, is going to be upgraded automatically by Google. Optionally, the date you can decide the date for the upgrade, but Google is taking care of everything. You just have to say, OK, do the upgrade today. So the new version of Kubernetes 1.5 is scheduled for December. And it can come uh, one concrete date. And then one week after that, it's going to be available here. You just have to decide if you want the upgrade or don't want it. And then another feature that comes out of the box with Container Engine would be multi-zone deployments. And multi-zone means that when you're defining your cluster, uh, basically you're saying here in, in which zone you want the cluster. You can also say how many additional zones do you want to use as backup. So if you want high availability, you don't have to start thinking about how I'm, I'm going to do this. Just configure your cluster, put it in two different zones inside of the same region, and, and there you have high availability. Um, this is how things work with Container Engine. You can perfectly find, define your application and de design your application and deploy it with OpenShift on-prem. And then when you're going to the, pu to the public cloud, you can deploy still with OpenShift or you can deploy with Container Engine. And the good thing about this is having options. Being Kubernetes all the way means that you can choose where you are, uh, where you are deploying. And the last innovation in the Kubernetes world is about federated services. And federated services is in the next step. We have been talking about, OK, multiple zones inside the same region. What happens if I want to combine different providers? Cluster that is living on-prem, cluster that is living on Google Cloud Platform, cluster that is living on AWS. With federated services, you can start uh, using that on, uh, with Kubernetes. Federated services is going to use DNS. To, to learn about where to send your traffic. Should they send your traffic to this cluster, or should they send your traffic to this other traffic? When you are deploying your application, you can deploy in a single point, and this, uh, this control plane is going to send your application to all the different clusters, or the clusters that you have indicated. Like, for example, and this is work in progress, you can, des you can design your application and say, OK, I want to, def to deploy this application in all my clusters, but please only select clusters that are a what's the word, enabled for PCI compliance. I want to process credit card transactions, and I only want to deploy these applications in clusters that are enabled to do so. And you, when you are deploying with federated services, this is going to be taken care of automatically. Now, these are options. Again, you could, be say, you could say, I have my continuous integration environment, and my continuous integration environment is already deploying in all my clusters. This is just configuration on Jenkins. Or you can say, I'm going to use this as a single point of contact, and I, I'm going to use that to deploy my application. Um, we, 
we have been talking about uh, the third generation of cloud uh, before in the in the keynote, which is basically from the point of view that we have at Google, uh, first generation would be just hardware and just co-locating your hardware uh, in the cloud. Second generation of cloud would be just virtualization of that. Uh, I'm going to have the same hardware, but it's going to be virtualized. It's going to be virtual machines and load balancers that I'm going to put in the cloud. And then the third generation is about using services provided by your cloud provider. And this is, uh, this is where we have been at Google for several years now, using the, uh, our own internal services. And today, I'm going to focus only on two of them. There are many, but I'm going to focus on two. First of all, it's a stack driver. Stackdriver is about monitoring and logging of your services, dashboards and alerts, and also seeing my logs in real time. Dashboards and alerts for everything that is deployed in your systems, be it Google Cloud Platform or not. You can also, you can also send your own statistics to Stackdriver. But with Stackdriver, you don't manage servers. You don't have to configure anything. You just have to start sending your data there, which is a small configuration file that you can set for a Apache, Nginx, a Tomcat. And then this is going to be automatically managed by Stackdriver. And then you're going to have, yeah, dashboards, and you're going to have logging, and so on. But particularly interesting is error reporting, which is a new feature of Stackdriver that allows you to see the different errors that happen in the, in the application. This is the, uh, the mobile interface. You also have the web interface. So you can carry this application with you and be notified about errors in your application, meaning that you're going to see this is a new exception. These exceptions are happening uh, frequently. You can see here all the different occurrences of the exception. And you can also see when was the first time, the last time that it happened, and in which version of your application this error is happening. Stackdriver is available today. I mean, it's been VA for some time now. And uh, Stackdriver can work not only with resources that you are deploying with Google Cloud, but also with, uh, with applications that you are deploying on Amazon Web Services. And in the short term, it's going to be also available for on-prem. So a single point of contact that you don't have to configure. It's totally fine if you're thinking, I already have my own thing. I am working with Grafana, I am working with uh, Prometheus, and I have already configured my own, uh, my own lo login and monitoring. But this is something that works out of the box. So if you have a small project and you don't want to invest that extra, extra mile, extra effort in configuring all of this, you can just connect to Stackdriver and, uh, and let it go. You don't have to configure anything to have a Stackdriver up and running. So I was saying that I was going to mention only two managed services. Uh, we can talk after this uh, later if you want about cloud and NoSQL and so uh, sorry, SQL and NoSQL and so on. But I also wanted to mention about big data. Big data is something that most of the companies that we know of is just improvising the solution, like putting together some spreadsheets and then adding some charts on top of those spreadsheets, which, which is totally fine. Um, putting together some access databases. Uh, I have heard, uh, heard about the some companies doing that as well. Um, in general, improvising stuff, because big data typically is a huge investment, and we don't have the time, and we don't have the resources to do that. So you have to start thinking about which features I'm going to use, which frameworks, how I'm going to do the integration. And our pers perspective about big data is that actually all we want is a button. All we want is a button that says run query. We don't want to manage servers. We don't want to manage uh, how to send the information. Uh, and we want the simplest possible interface for that. And that basically is BigQuery. BigQuery is based on Dremel. Dremel is the framework, that, uh, the, the, sorry, the platform that we use internally at Google for questions that require processing a huge amount of information. BigQuery basically is, an, uh, is using an SQL uh, language, is using an SQL interface. It requires zero administrations of servers. You just upload your data. You don't have to do anything, anything on BigQuery. And then you can upload your data either in, as CSV or JSON. You can add your information in via streaming or just batch uh, uploading your, your data. And with BigQuery, you don't have to worry about how big your information is. Uh, the biggest data set uh, for BigQuery outside of Google is 38 petabytes of information. Uh, that, to give you a reference, that's in the line of all the stock trade uh, operations in, the, in all the stock trade indexes in the US for six months. That's more or less the, the, kind of the, the, the amount of data that we are talking about. 
a single platform where you don't have to manage your servers uh, that allows you to, to upload as much information as, as you need it, and then use SQL, SQL, normal SQL with tables and uh, relational or uh, n the normalized data if you need that, like JSON, or JSON fields and so on. So as a wrap up, there, there are many advantages uh, for the hybrid cloud and we were mentioning them in, in, them in the beginning. There are many reasons to say, okay, I want to deploy on-prem and I want to deploy in the cloud and I want to move things around. Um, but then when you're deploying to the public cloud, when you're thinking about deploying, deploying the public, uh, in the public cloud, there are many different services that you can use. No one is removing the responsibility that you have when you're deploying in your own premises. So you want to deploy on premises and you want to set up your own login infrastructure, your own uh, SQL database, your own big data platform, you can do that. But when you're moving to the public cloud, you can save time by doing things more efficiently. You can use Stackdriver if you want to remove configuration. If you don't want to configure stuff, you have Stackdriver, Dataproc, uh, Google Container Engine. Uh, if you don't want to go through the huge investment of setting up a huge network for your disaster recovery center, you can just go with our network. It's up there, just start using it. If you want to get as close to your users as possible, that's already there. And then you can add your CDN if you want on top of that. Some of these services are constantly being improved and that makes a huge difference. If we're talking about machine learning APIs, deploying your own machine learning means that you have to assume keeping that up to date every year. When you're deploying with machine learning, as our machine learnings in Google Cloud Platform, Vision API, Speech API, Natural Language Processing, you can do the same, the same mm, algorithms that we use at Google internally for uh, features in Android, for features that we use for other, other systems. And the good thing is that these networks are constantly being upgraded, constantly being improved. Same thing with Container Engine, that is constantly being upgraded to the latest version of, con uh, of Kubernetes. And then some things just cannot be replicated on premises, like BigQuery. With BigQuery, you can process terabytes of, of information in, in seconds. And the only way of doing that is because I, we have a huge infrastructure that you can share and use when you are deploying. And this is simply not profitable if you try to repl uh, replicate that, uh, reproduce that on-prem. This is simply not worth the, uh, the effort. So. Uh, this is it. This is some, these are some of the features that we have to, uh, for the cloud. And again, you don't have to design your application any, any differently. You just have to start using things when you're deploying in the public cloud and then reproducing these same features when you're deploying for the private cloud. Um, so one thing that I am happy about coming to this kind of events is that we can start conversations about how you do deployments. How are you planning to, to do your own deployments? We're going to be giving away some Chromecasts that we brought uh, today. Uh, so drop by our booth and start a conversation with us. Um, there is one link over here in case you want to get started with Google Cloud. Uh, if you want to get started with Google Cloud, just creating your account is going to give you $300 for free for the next 60 days. By using this link, you're going to have uh, an extra, I don't know if it's extra 200 or extra 500 uh, credit, so you can, you can uh, experiment with the platform. Um, yeah, and we're going to have a Kubernetes workshop. Uh, we're going to have a Kubernetes workshop online. If you are interested, also in this link, you're going to be able to see uh, to see how to, to register for that. So uh, we still have two minutes for questions. Any questions? I speak too fast, right? Sir again? So when you're moving between zones, you're going to have one pricing. When you're moving between different regions, you're going to have a different pricing. But if you search for Google Cloud Network pricing, you're going to see the cost of everything. One extra thing that you have when you're deploying on Google Cloud is that the cost for communicating with global APIs from Google is free. So if you have to integrate with Google Maps or, Google or Gmail or any other of the more than 100 APIs that we have, that traffic is free. And then if it's inside of the zone, it's free. If it's between zones or if, if it's between regions, you're going to be applying different, different charges. But you can check, check that pricing online. It, it's all there. Any other question?
in 52 seconds. Now 48. Okay, thank you very much. I, we're going to be around in the in our booth uh, just by uh, if you want to continue the conversation. Thanks.